we're in our, our third week of our series, The Aftermath. Uh, as you guys know, Aftermath defined is simply this. It's a, a counter effect or a consequence of a significant, unpleasant event. And we've been working our way through how that cross is a significant, unpleasant event to many different kinds of people that many people have within them in their hearts as, as human nature, with our flesh, with our sinful being. And so today we're going to talk about the third person that each of us have inside of us. We don't like it. We're probably not proud of it. Nobody's going to jump right up and say, hey, that's me. Well, if they do, they're going to be identifying with the person, actually. It's disturber of the faith. It's it, it simply put, it's a person who is negative and doubts the will of God. Simply put, it's a person that would block another person from the cross of Jesus Christ. You guys know what I'm talking about. It, it, it's that feeling on the highway when you just got done drinking 24 ounces of coffee and forgot to go to the bathroom before you left. It, it, it's the feeling of your crying baby awakening at 1230 in the middle of the night when you just fell asleep at 1145. And folks, it's the same feeling when you look at that cross right there and you see the horizontal and the vertical where God's will and man's intersected 2,000 years ago. And in hearts in this room today, sadly, it's still a rough fight. You see, we want to do the things of God. Paul says, I don't understand it. The, the good I want to do, I can't, but the bad, it just comes so easy. It's just natural. Wretched man, who's going to save me? And, and then he gives the thanks to the only person who can save, Jesus Christ. Amen? And so we see in Scripture listed 148 times in my... Southern Baptist printed Bible, sorry, HCSB, just throwing a little prop out there to the Southern Baptist, praise God. All right, so we're, we're not denominational, don't give me any emails or anything, I'm just, the Bible was written, it was a good Bible, I got it, okay. HCSB listed 148 times, 148 times, this word, this nature, the word is deceived. 148 times in scripture it is mentioned. 148 times. Anybody agree that 148 times something talks about something? It's, it might be important. That's kind of like my wife. It's your turn to change the diaper. Your turn, by the way. Hey, just remind me, the next one that goes, your turn. Okay, 148 times later, I change the diaper. Because I get it now, right? Deception. It's happening all across America today. And sadly enough, folks, this is true. It happens in churches. It happens in people's lives all the time. It sadly happens when small groups of believers get together and they don't want to focus on this. They want to focus on this. Gossip, hatred, slander, evil, things that you should not be talking about, don't need to be talking about, does not build anybody up, does not encourage anybody, but what it does fast is it tears everybody around you down. Deception, 148 times. And a commonality from cover to cover in this Bible. How many people know cover to cover trumps 148, right? Truth. Truth. Cover to cover in this word is truth. There is no way to trump 148 things with just one. But when you go cover to cover and you find 148 billion... Oh, we can do a ball game now. We can have at it. So what's the problem? It happened this week in Capitol Hill. It hits businesses, homes, marriages, friendships, even churches. Division, disagreement, disorder, distraction, destruction, flat-out disturbances. They hinder us. And sadly enough, regardless of what we say, how we choose to say it, some people feed off these disturbances. Some people love a little excitement, a little bit of shakeup, and, and we're going to go through a series of things that you can write down that I just want you guys, I'm challenging you guys this week. I want everybody in here to write this down. These three questions that, I, that you guys need to be asking yourself this week, how far do I play into these things? Question number one, how much drama do I play into? 
Question number two, how much do I magnify my problems and not magnify Jesus? Where do I go for edification, encouragement, and enlightenment? Paul spoke about people in the church, folks, that weren't doing the edifying thing. They, they, they were doing far from the edifying thing. Matter of fact, we see these words, if you guys are taking notes, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 6 through 15. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to keep away from every brother who walks irresponsibly and not according to the tradition received from us. For you yourselves know how you must imitate us. We were not irresponsible among you. We did not eat anyone's bread free of charge. Instead, we labored and toiled, working night and day, so that we would not be a burden to any of you. It is not that we don't have the right to support, but we did it so that you may make it ourselves as an example to you, so that you would imitate us. In fact, when we were with you, this is what we commanded you. If anyone's not willing to work, he should not eat. For we hear that there are some among you who walk irresponsibly, not working at all, but interfering with the work of others. Now we command and exhort such people by the Lord Jesus Christ that quietly working they may eat their own bread. Brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. And if anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take note of that person. Don't associate with them so that they may be ashamed. Yet don't treat him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. Folks, today this is your warning as a brother. This is your warning to many people and uh, have many questions about how far is too far. And I just want to tell you this. A lot of people come in, and this is a very common question I'm asked as a pastor. It really is. At what point am I gossiping? At what point is this gossip? Check the motives and what purpose does it serve? When it comes out, does it build people up? When you start the thing, and mind you, see, sometimes our biggest problems as humans is we don't begin with the end in mind, right? I call these people sharks looking for the kill, smell a little bit of blood, and they all run in. I want to tell you something that we all have in common as followers of Christ. We all agree on one thing. We're messed up, and we can't do it alone. Every person in here, regardless of your denominational background, regardless of your biblical scholarship, regardless of who you hang out with from week in to week out, has one thing in common. You say every time you step in this door, I can't do it alone and I need Jesus Christ to help me. So we start off with common ground. And we work our way into this. What if, church, what if today... We gained, as a congregation, as a group of followers, as a body of believers, what if we gained a healthy perspective on these disturbances instead of a negative perspective? Because I think one of Satan's biggest tricks is negativity. He poisons our perspective just a little bit and everything goes south. I don't know, man. Marriage kind of weak this week. I don't know. All my other friends are living it up. Everybody else is having a good time. I could be having a good time this weekend, too. Instead, I'm pouring into this marriage. Instead, I'm doing this thing. Instead, I'm serving at the church. Instead, I'm doing all these other things. When everybody else is going out and doing this, oh, what about this one? I just wanted to hear my brother or sister's problems when they called me with an issue. Did you? Or did you participate in leading that brother or sister further away from the plan of God? You see, one of the first questions that we have to ask ourselves when we take in a little bit of negativity is this. Have you spoke to so-and-so about this? Have you talked to the person about this? Have you, have you sought scripture on it? Have you sought reconciliation on it? And by the way, do you understand that Jesus covers all? 1 Peter 4, a love covers every transgression. Everything's been covered by the blood. It's in perspective. It's in seeing, hey, this side of the coin sees the death of man. This side of the coin sees the resurrection and the life that only Jesus Christ can bring. You see, today we're going to encounter a group of highly religious people. You know where we're at in Scripture. If you, if you guys want to just forward it ahead to that next slide, give you a little summary of where we've been and where we're heading here. We're in Acts 4, 1 through 4 today. 
In the summary where we're at, Jesus, as you know, was on his way out. He is, he's getting ready to ascend to heaven. And what does he do? He gives us all the same great commission, right? Every person in this room. Go and make disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And teach them to obey what I've commanded you. And I will be with you, he says. You see, every person in here is on the same mission. Every person in here has the same Jesus. Every person in here has the same God, the same Spirit. But every person in here also has the same enemy. The thief's job, John 10, 10, job description. You want to know if you're doing God's will or the devil's will real quick, right? Thief, what is his job description? Kill, steal, destroy. Jesus gives his clearly. I've came that you might have life and life in abundance. If this isn't producing abundant life and it's leading to a death, a destruction, or a theft, you better believe you're, you're working on the enemy's side. You're looking at things from the enemy's perspective. I will tell you the one thing that stops growth in the body of Christ more than anything else is this. The lack of encouragement from the brothers and sisters in Christ. You get on Facebook and you see everybody's problems, right? How many people do you see, praise God, we have the answer to the problem? Praise God, Jesus came, everybody's forgiven, salvation has hit, the Holy Spirit has been shed abroad upon us, we can have life and life in abundance, but guess what? It's up to you. It's your perspective. It's what you choose to do with it. It's the encouragement you choose to seek. It's the people you choose to surround yourself with. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, don't be misled. Don't be deceived. There's that word again. Don't be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. He was speaking, when he was speaking, he was speaking about people that contradicted the same thing that this group of religious people is going to contradict today. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, if the resurrection really happened, that puts us all on a pretty humble playing field. It puts us all at a really low level. And folks, I want to tell you, from what I see of religion, religion can teach you to magnify self a little bit more than magnify God. I see a lot of pride in Scripture. I see a lot of pride in prayer. I see a lot of pride, pride, pride. And the truth of it is, had Jesus not come, we have nothing. No eternal life. No forgiveness of our sins. And what about this one? What about the person in this room that has mistaken God and man this morning? You see, many people have a misunderstanding of something. Many people look to God for healing and they look to man for forgiveness. When in all actuality, it's only Jesus that can forgive. In what, for, uh, James 5, verse 16, it says, Confess your sins to one another that you may be healed. And pray for one another. You see, I think that if we're not careful, we put the wrong job description on the wrong person, and we don't really give God what's God's. Amen? So Jesus ascends to heaven, and he commissions us as followers. The disciples receive the Spirit and cannot contain it. I love that. Just think about it. And when the Spirit comes, if the Spirit really falls upon you, if the Spirit takes control of your life, when the Spirit hits... Who are you living for? It, it kind of takes over everything you have going on. I mean, because let's be honest, there's nothing in this book that describes the way I was living life before the Spirit. It tells me, I need the Spirit, I need the Scripture. Message starts spreading like wildfire, Pentecost, salvations, church growth, all this awesome stuff. Thousands of people being baptized, thousands of people accepting Jesus Christ, thousands of people coming together in generosity, giving, doing, helping one another. And then all of a sudden, as it always goes, you can't have so much good without a little bit bad happening. The truth of life is this. Satan wants to kill our focus. He's looking for people in this room right now, and here's what he's competing for. He's, he's competing for your adoration, your affection, and your worship. You aren't going to flat out come in here and tell me, hey, I'm worshiping Satan, but by your actions and by your words and by your thoughts, it's pretty revealed in your heart who's got your attention and who's got your affection. 
You see, sometimes we worship the wrong God, and it's not even Satan. Sometimes we, we worship the God of pride, the God of self. Sometimes we worship the God of sports, popular one. Sometimes we worship the God of babies. They take a lot of attention, amen? You guys know what I'm talking about. Number four, lame man healed, message preach, and the results are in. And here they are, ladies and gentlemen. Are you ready for the results? Drum roll, please. Okay, sorry, John Wilson up here. Number one, 5,000 people accept Christ. Can you say, you like how I put that word, paw raise the Lord? I mean, you just got to paw raise him sometimes. You got to take a pause in between and just let him know how good he's been, amen? Sometimes you got to paw raise the Lord. Take some time out. Life's going life's gonna to be what it's going to be while you're here. Guess what? This is your time during the week that you know for sure you can edify Jesus Christ in your life. And you can build yourself up. Kill those distractions. Praise the Lord. This is awesome. Anybody with me? Yeah. If 5,000 people get saved, I mean, I'm dying to preach a message where one. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> Anyways, 5,000 people get saved. This is amazing. For those of you that have been a part of Creekside, 180 baptisms in two, in two years? Almost three. The best is yet to come. Here's the thing. 5,000 people just got saved. This is awesome. But to some, it's not. To some, it poses a threat. To some, control's about to shift. And if any of you guys remember... That deal in Luke 4 with Jesus where he's tempted by Satan. You remember what Satan did to him? He took him on top of the mountain and he said, Hey, I'll give you the power, but you got to worship me. you got to come to my side. There's power. You can have control of all these people. All these things will worship you. You will be awesome. And what happened to Satan himself? What was his big downfall? He wanted to consider himself equal with God Almighty. Pride got him. Worship me. Worship my stuff. It's what the world's saying every time we step out of the church doors. Look at the billboard. Look at the new house. Look at the cars. Look at the clothes. Look at the debt you can accrue and really ruin your life. Jesus provides a free gift, a radical gift of grace, a life-changing freedom, a lifetime of fun, a lifetime of real companionship that you don't have to go out, go out every weekend and blow $100 to have. And for some reason, in our society, in the gravitational pull of man, that free gift isn't as accepted as we'd like it to be. You go out and you try to reach out to somebody, right? Right? Go to Walmart, share the love of Christ. Hey, here's uh, $10. I want to take care of your groceries. Here's this, here's that. By the way, church is Sunday and Jesus loves you. How many people do that with it? No. Because when I start speaking the gospel, that's a little bit different. When I start actually telling people what I believe in, that's a little hard. The $10 is fine. That's not an inconvenience. $10, okay, I'll take care of you. Cool. But to invest in your life and tell you who I truly believe in, the message I really believe in, there are people in this room right now who, to my disheartening, your friends probably don't even know you believe in Jesus. People in your life probably don't even know you believe in Jesus. And I, I think that there's many followers that Jesus is wondering, though, if you, he, he wonders if you believe in Jesus. We need to awaken with the message, and we need to believe in the message, and we need to go out and truly share the message, but before we share it, we have to make sure the message we believe in is actually solid doctrine, solid truth. A miracle, a message, and now the truth, opposition from the disturbers. Acts 4, 1 through 4, if you got your Bible. If you don't, I don't know. You're grounded. Now as they were speaking to the people, the priests, the commander of the temple, police, and the Sadducees confronted them because they were provoked that they were teaching the people and proclaiming the resurrection from the dead using Jesus as the example. So they seized them and put them in custody until the next day since it was already evening, but many of those who heard the message believed and the number of the men came to about 5,000. We got a lot going on here. 
We got a healed guy who can't deny that he's been healed. Doesn't know what he got healed by, but he's pretty sure it's got to be the power of God because nothing else could explain it. You got a crowd getting saved. 5,000 people got witness too. But you also have this religious place that doesn't believe in the resurrection. You also have these group of people that are dead in their trespasses that don't know what eternal life is. You also have a group of people who have done nothing but malign the work and the word of Christ. How does that meet us? Well, Jesus told Peter something very interesting in Mark 8. Mark 8, if you got scripture here. He told Peter, he said... Him and Peter are talking, and Peter basically, I'm going to go to 831 through 34, you can take note of it. Him and Peter are basically talking back and forth, they're having this conversation, and Jesus is telling him, basically he's predicting his crucifixion. He's saying, the son of, the son of man is going to suffer. The religious people are going to hand me over, they're going to hate me, they're going to do all these things, and Peter, what does he say? Jesus, the Bible says that he openly, or he, Jesus was speaking openly, but Peter took him aside from the conversation with his fellow disciples. And he said, Jesus, you're out of your mind. He rebukes Jesus. How many people in here would have the nerve to rebuke Jesus? Peter's crazy. All right? Peter goes, he takes Jesus aside and he says, you're crazy. These people, Jesus, are you serious? And what does Jesus respond with? Get behind me, Satan. Jesus wasn't even deceived by the words of the enemy that came from his closest followers. Think about it. Sometimes the devil uses the people that we love the most to destroy our relationship with Jesus. Sometimes the word of God, better yet, all the time the word of God is true. And Jesus says, why would you think I came to bring peace? came to bring a sword. A man's greatest enemy is going to be the members of his own household. Friends are going to turn against friends, brothers against mothers, sisters and sisters, aunts and uncles, so on and so forth. Here we go. Division. Disruption. Disagreement. Too many people want to stay in between, though, and not pick a side of the fence. All that's happening to you is you just keep getting your heart ripped in half because you have divided loyalty. If you're in here this morning and you have a broken heart, a hurting heart, it is because your loyalty has been divided enough for it to break in whatever matter. And so you see, Jesus told Peter, so Peter himself had to know these religious people are going to cause a lot of trouble. Not you guys in church this morning, but other church people. They can be, they can be feisty. So Peter should have known better. Peter was going into the same situation. He saw the same people flip on Jesus. The same exact people. He saw it happen once, right? How many people know if you see something happen and it's the same group of people and they come back, you need to be a little bit cautious, right? I mean, I don't know about you, but if I see a guy on, the, on TV that just got done stabbing 500 people, I'm not inviting him home for, in my home for coffee. Anybody agree with me on that? Peter knew what these people were full of. You kidding me? But here's what Peter knew beyond what these people were full of. Jesus is worth giving my life for. Jesus is worth giving my popularity for. Jesus, if he is real in my heart, is worth me giving everything up and going to jail for. Because he did, didn't he? You see, these Sadducees, these Pharisees, this, these group of people that always tried to trick Jesus, right? They always came to him with questions. The Sadducees themselves came to Jesus and time after time. Mark, Matthew, Luke, you can look up every account. It's in Matthew 22, if you look for it, 22 through 23 through 28. And in, in Mark, it's Mark, it's in Mark, it's in Luke, Luke 20, okay? I got it here on my notes, hold on. Just look at Mark, read the whole book, you'll get it. All right, church folks, I just got done warning myself. In Matthew, they come to him and they say this question. This is what they came to him and they asked. They said, hey, suppose a man and a wife, they're married, right? Check this out. Jesus is going to trick you. They're married, right? So they said, I do, at Creekside. They're married. Where are my married people at in here? 
Everybody like being married? If you don't, don't answer. All right, we're in church. Oh, wait a minute. All right. So Jesus, he goes, Jesus, Jesus, I got a question for you. You got to answer me. Lord, help me. Got a question. A man and his wife are married, and, you know, he dies. <laughs> it's a bad day, right? Died. Um, now, the law says, teacher, correct me if I'm wrong, but the law says that his brother needs to marry her because they need to have kids. But then he died. So the next brother married, and it happened seven times. Can you imagine living that life? Wow. I mean, Jesus answered it a lot more gracefully than I did, than I would, right? He just simply says, and what does Jesus say to him? He says, so who, the question arises, who does this woman belong to in this resurrection life, this resurrection you say is true? Who does this woman belong to? What Jesus said was his first response. You are deceived because you don't know Scripture. And you don't know the power of God. Wow! Deception, deceit, from the opposition every time it looks like it has a little bit of truth, but it really has none. It looks just a little get good, a little bit, a little nice, just to get you lured in. Threefold temptation, you can write it down and it will save you a lot of time. In temptation, there's always a tempter, there's a lure, and there's a lust. A tempter? is the outside object. Hey, come get a loan from Cash King that dresses up really fancy here in Warrington with the whole suit, right? He's out at the corner every Friday if you need one, right? Payday loan. Come get a loan, $500, but in a couple of weeks you'll be paying $1,500 for that loan. It looks really good, though. The lure's there, 500 bucks. I mean, most, 500 bucks. I don't have 500 bucks right now. Sure, I'll slide on in, see the king, and shake his hand. 500 bucks, okay, now we're $1,500 into it. The lure hit, I bit the bait, the lust was there, I needed what I needed, and now I'm $1,500 deeper. How does this happen in our spiritual life? Going to the wrong people for the wrong counsel. All right, I'll, I'll tell you this one right now, and this is the best one that ever comes in. I've went to seven other people and they told me this, they told me that, they told me this, they told me that, they told me this, they told me that. Has any of the seven people said, what does this say? Because that's the best counsel you can give. And if they aren't reading it, you shouldn't be helping them anyways because they aren't willing to hear the truth. What does this say? Don't be deceived. Bad company corrupts good character, good moral. When you're trying to do the things of God, don't be surprised when the Sadducee comes in your life and says, well, who do you really belong to? You say Jesus on Sunday, but Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, kind of a rough deal. Who do you really belong to? And so they start shaking it up, right? The Sadducees just start shaking it up. So the sequence of events here. Number one, a betrayer, a snitch, a gossip provokes a division. Come, you, you see what was said, right? Let's go back here real quick. Go, go back here. Somebody provoked them, it says, because they were provoked that they were teaching the people. Somebody was in there meddling around getting some people excited. Somebody, somebody was in there causing a stir, causing some ruckus, needed some attention. Somebody was in there, just like in... Marriages. Just like in business partnerships. Just like in churches. Just like in everything else in life. All it takes is one little bit of bad counsel and you're so spun out of control you don't know what to do. And you spend more time on doing than you actually get to do with the person because at the point that they've taken seven harsh advices, it's kind of hard to show them straight truth. Number two, those in authority are obviously not have to be happy because the power shift. The power shifting. This name of Jesus, you're under arrest for speaking that because if that's true, our temple's getting shut down. If that's true, then we got it wrong. If that's true, then I need to repent of my sins. If that's true, I can't keep living the way I'm living. If that name of Jesus is true in the followers of life, you've given up everything because you've counted the cost, you know he's good, and you're falling in faithfully. It's the truth. What are we doing? Who are we living for? 
Number three, lots of stuff that could steal the joy, right? This is a bad deal. Two men get arrested for just proclaiming the name of Jesus, just wanting Jesus' name to go a little bit further. 5,000 people. How many people know, know there were some busy angels in heaven that day when they were accepting Christ? They were probably up there doing the Macarena or something. I don't even know. But they were excited because the angels rejoice over just one that comes to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. But you're going to see as the story plays out that there's a true concept in this thought, and I want you guys to please write this down. Please, I urge you, I beg you, go steal a pen from the people in the back if you got to. Stab them. I don't know. Don't, no, don't stab them. That's horrible. Father, forgive me. Anyways, <laughs> write this down. Take note of this. This will save you a lot of trouble this week. This will save you a lot, a lot of grief in the people you affiliate with, and it will check your motives of your heart fast. If I had to lay my life down for only one, would I still lay my life down? You see, we look at 5,000, and we could be flattered by that. How many people in here would be honest to, know, honest to tell me, and I'm included in this group, by the way, Sometimes we gauge our bank account success. Sometimes we gauge our success in life by numbers and logistics. How many things did I fix this month? How many customers do I have? How much money do I have in my bank account, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? We can look at 5,000 people getting saved, and to us here today, this is really exciting and easy to worship stuff, right? But to the men that gave their life and gave their freedom up so that they would get saved, this is a rough day. To walk into a room, and I know that everybody in here knows this feeling. You walk into the room, and you know there's people in there that don't like you. Anybody ever feel that? Ever feel the tension? You, you know they're there. You, you pick up on it. I, we got something, okay? There's, you don't like me. Like, like Peter probably knew you guys are going to arrest me. Once, as soon as I throw this Jesus thing out, I'm done. I saw what you did to Jesus. I'm definitely not better. And you walk in, and you got a couple options. You can fold up and be defeated, or you can claim Jesus and run right through it. Fold up and be defeated, claim Jesus and run right through it, because if he got persecuted, friends, we all will. If he got hated on, every person in this room will. If he had disturbers, certainly we're going to have disturbers. As a matter of fact, if you never have any disagreement at all, you might want to ask yourself, what am I even standing for? Have I ever even made a stand? Have I ever even went over the rope and said, you know what, Jesus, you got my life, and if your word says it, I'm believing it. I'm banking on it. This is truth. This is solid. This is the bread of life. But what cannot be denied? Verse 4. But many of those who heard the message, I love this. Just, just look at this. Look at the words that are underlined. Many heard and believed. Many. How many people know many is a good thing to say? I, I like to have many Hershey's miniatures when I go home today. I like many of them. All right? Not M-I-N-E-N-I-M-A-N-Y. Many. Not a little amount. Many. Especially those Mr. Good bars. Mm -mm -mm. Public shout out. They heard, how does faith come? By hearing. And they chose. Then it was their time to respond. They believed. Many heard, believed. I want to ask you this question. So worship team comes on up here. How many of you have heard the gospel of Jesus Christ your whole life, but never really full-heartedly believed in it? How many of us have heard lies from the devil all week long and chose to believe those things? How many of us understand that we are going to hear a lot of crazy things this week and we've got to choose what we believe? Many heard believed. 
The disturbers came out. They tried stopping the show just like they did for Jesus. They tried stopping the show for Peter. And guess what? As soon as you go out in public today, they're going to try to kill your show too. They're going to try to steal your thunder too. If there is one thing the devil does not want is a Christian who knows his life is victorious. Her life is victorious. What are we really banking on, guys? I mean, honestly, am I banking on man? Paul said in Galatians 1, let me be cursed if I'm trying to win the approval of man. I understand it every week when I get up to speak that there's going to be people who don't agree with me, but guess what? If you don't, let's take it right here. The one thing I do know about this church, about this congregation, about what we are doing here, is we will impact lives for Jesus. We will stand on the word of God. And we will not compromise our beliefs. I'd love to preach a good, happy, feel-good, seeker-friendly message. Everybody comes in. But the truth is, you need to know what we believe. So if you're going to come alongside it, you believe in the same thing. Doctrine is huge, friends. Satan sifts people every day. He shifts families every day over disagreements in real, actual beliefs. You say, Pastor, well, what really matters? The majors first. We'll start with those. And a good three things to remember how we do this is God gets glorified, Jesus gets magnified, and the Spirit gets edified in our lives. We believe in God the Father that he sent his one and only son to this earth so that whomever would believe in that name. Wow, I like that. It's like anybody. Come on. Anybody that believes in that name will be saved and will have eternal life. And the second part is that Jesus lived a spotless, perfect, totally awesome life here on earth. And it gave us proof and it gave us hope to show that he was who he says he was. He performed signs and wonders. He had disciples. He lived an awesome journey, an awesome life. And when he went to that cross, it showed all of us our debt's paid. Done. Free gift of grace. And that third part, what did Jesus say? Jesus gave us spirit when he left. Because he didn't want to leave us as orphans. Because God's a good father. And I just want to close with this. Many people in here did not have good parents or do not have good parents or think that they will be bad parents because of the way their parents were. There's only one perfect parent, and it's your father, God. There's only one perfect father. There's only one way to be a father in a Christian household, and it's by getting the example from Father God. But God loved us so much. I mean, just think about this real quick. This is blow your mind. He didn't just stop at Jesus. He bankrupt heaven with his spirit to give it upon us because he didn't want anybody in this room to be an orphan. He didn't want anybody in this room to be an outcast, to be a down and out, to be a loser, to be a failure, to be a reject, to continue to be a disturber of the faith. What he wanted more than anything else is he wanted all to come to repentance and know him and live with him forever and eternity. That's what he wanted. So here's my question. With everybody's head bowed, everybody's eyes closed, I just want you to be flat out honest with me here. Are you believing some lies? I mean, honestly. Do, do you think for some reason, I mean, for some reason has your life turned into more of serving people than it has serving God? You serve God first, and then out of that, the overflow is serving people. But if you serve people, then you serve God. It's not going to work. If, if, if you'd be so honest to say, you know what, the truth of my life is, if, if the story is written today on me, I am a person who I seek man's approval above God's approval. If that's you and you want to deal with that issue, but nobody looking around, this is it. This is the opportunity today, and I believe this could be a defining moment in your life to say, you know what? I've let a lot of disturbers come into my life. I've let a lot of lies come into my life. I've let a lot of people come in between me and Jesus. And the truth of the matter is, all those hurts have been covered by the blood. 
All those failures have been covered by the blood. Everything that's in yesterday is yesterday, and I know I serve a God of eternity, so he isn't in my yesterday, but he's looking ahead, and he's wanting me to focus my eyes upon him. If you're in this room and you'd be honest enough to say this morning, that's me, Pastor. Can I just see your hand? I have been pleasing people. I haven't been pleasing God. He sees my heart. I know my heart. I know what I'm doing here. I'm trying to please my husband, please my wife before I please God. I'm trying to please others before I please God. Matter of fact, by the time I get to even pleasing God, I'm so worn out from pleasing everybody else, I can't even please him. And what I want to do is you guys lower your heads. Lower your hands, lower your heads, and focus on this word. God's word to man is this. People will fail you, I will not. People will hurt you, I can't. People will walk out of your life, I can't walk out of your life because I gave you life. Today I want to make an agreement all across the room, and what I want the people that believe in the agreement, I just want you to stand and be ready to worship God when I say it. I want, if you are in this room and you just say, Today, I want to declare that my life belongs to Jesus Christ. I've died of myself. I've died of my sins. He's forgiven everything. The Holy Spirit now lives in me to convict me, to comfort me, to lead me in truth, lead me in righteousness. And what I'm doing by standing there is I'm making a stand for Jesus. And I'm saying, I'm done pleasing people until I can please God. My life is nil. So at the count of three, what I want you guys to do, is I want you guys to stand if that's you. If you're not able to stand, I understand. One, two, three. It would appear to me that we have a church full of people wanting to please God. It would appear to me that we have a congregation that just wants to do the will of God. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We worship you. We honor you, God. We glorify you. We magnify you. We want our edification. We want our encouragement. We want our lives to be rooted in the word of God, be rooted in the person of Jesus Christ with solid faith in the resurrection, knowing, Father, we will resurrect. We will. Your word says that any man who believes in you will not be put to shame on that day. So, Father, what these people are saying when they stand is Jesus Christ died for their sins. He was buried. When he resurrected, it showed us all. We're forgiven. Let it die. Let it burn. It's done. It's over with. It's gone. And from this point forward, Father, our goal and our aim is to please you. Because we know Jesus is the one that saved us. You're, you're the one that gives us life, that gives us eternity. And just like Paul found out, just like Peter found out, just like all the disciples found out, there will be people who want to interrupt and discourage our walk with you. But Father, we don't get our encouragement from them. It chokes on them. We get our encouragement from you, from your word, from your scripture. Father, I pray for hungry, humble hearts in this room. God, that we would magnify you, that we would glorify you, and we would edify you in our actions, in our spirit, in our hope, in our living this week, Jesus. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. One closing announcement. One closing announcement, okay? The building purchase is going to be wrapped up this week, okay? With, with the knowledge okay that if you haven't participated you need to participate you need to participate a little more because we got a couple families that are really going way above and beyond and we want to help them out as much as we can because we want this to be a pooled effort we want this to be a team effort this is our church not just somebody's church this is our church first off it's god and then it's ours we take ownership in what we do amen and, and so if it's on your heart if you know you haven't participated you need to participate please do that asap and then we got a couple marriages coming up in the church. Everybody, yeah. If you don't think marriage is cool, act like it the next couple months at least. Let's get them through. No. Uh, Elsa and Donna are probably getting married. Give them a round of applause. A birdie told me that Amanda and uh, Tom, 
I almost called you Tim. I'm sorry because of Tim over here standing up. Tim, we're going to get married. Or Tom, she's not going to marry her dad. Praise God. He's going to give her away. And then this upcoming weekend, who's not present right now, but um, Ashley and Chuck are getting married. Three weddings. And the best news, God's math, we won't have six people in church. We'll have three because two become one. That's pretty cool. So praise God. Let's worship him, thank him, and give on your way out. It's a place where I love to run. It's a place where I sing the song to pray. It's a place where my heart and God and feels so great. There's a place where I lose myself in here. There's a place where I find myself in here. There's a place where I find God and feel to the If you're on the worship team or interested in being on the worship team, we're going to have a quick meeting after right now.